church is still on and the mission moves forward because it's as big as ever. And I've told you often that our mission here is to build the church our friends and neighbors will join and our children will one day lead. Right now, in the middle of this global crisis, we have an unprecedented opportunity to put our faith into action, to show our community the love of Christ, and to lean into the mission that God has given us. Right now, all around us, people are searching for answers, they're longing for hope, and they are hungry for significance and meaning. And so we will continue to build people, and we believe that God will continue to build His church. And we don't believe for a minute that Jesus is waiting until the day when we can gather in our facility, but rather he is building his church today. His church that is scattered across our community, meeting in homes together with family and friends and neighbors, watching this service together, worshiping together online, continuing week by week to love on one another and care for one another and serve one another. He is building that church today. We will not be that church when we get back together again. We are that church. hasn't been what we expected. But just like you, we're rolling with the punches here at Faith Church in Chandler. After months of offering only online worship, we're now holding in-person gatherings in our gym where we can easily spread everyone out across two services and follow all safety guidelines, including the mask mandate. And for those who can't join us in person, we're working hard to make our online worship experience feel almost like being there. While the format and the venue and the look have all changed, our commitment to help people find hope and meaning has stayed the same. 
If you're searching for hope and meaning in the midst of all of this madness, I invite you to join us online or in person this upcoming Sunday at 9.30 or 11. Hey Faith Church Online family, I'm so excited to see you joining us for worship today. I hope that you had a wonderful Christmas and New Year's. Uh, you were able to get some rest, you were able to have some time with family. I hope that you were excited for this upcoming year, 2021. We're hoping that God is going to work powerfully among us. We've got an exciting series where we're going to talk about the writings of Luke all year. Luke chapter 1 is this week for week 1, and every week we'll just look at a new chapter, so I hope that you're planning to be a part of that. I do have an exciting announcement. Today is January 3rd. One week from today, January 10th, we're going to begin offering our elementary uh, children's church again. That'll only be during the 11 o'clock service, which is the same time that we're offering nursery and preschool worship. And this will be for students up to fifth grade. Of course, some children prefer to sit with their parents, and so you're welcome to continue doing that. But if you've been waiting for children's church to be offered, we're offering that during the 11 o'clock service starting on January 10th. And we hope to offer kids ministry during both services in the future, but we're going only, only going to make that switch once it is safe and sustainable to do so. We're continuing uh, to navigate this post-COVID quarantine shutdown pandemic uh, world. And so we are taking these steps as slowly and as safely as we need to. But if you have a child who's in that age group, we would love for you to come and be with us during the 11 o'clock service starting next week. Now, in the past, Children's Church has taken place upstairs of the upstairs classroom of the gym. That will not be taking place because we are using the gym for our worship space. You can see that we've got everyone spread out in here. And so instead of uh, the Children's church taking place upstairs in the gym, it'll be down the classroom hallway, which is where the nursery and preschool classes are meeting. We're also excited uh, to look towards this year to see some of our groups come back and our Bible studies. Of course, all of this depends on how things go with uh, the rollout of vaccines and the response to the pandemic and what numbers do locally. We want to just continue to keep everyone safe. It has been our mission to do our very best to make it possible for you to grow closer to Jesus and keep you safe. And so we're trying to navigate how to best do both of those. We're excited to offer an elementary, uh, our elementary class for ages kindergarten to fifth grade uh, starting on January 10th. Let me encourage you to be faithful in giving, uh, to give generously. You can give online at faithandchandler.com slash give or give using the Venmo app to the at faithfwb church account. You've been incredibly generous so far through the pandemic 2019 really 2020 really shaped up to be a good year 2019 was a much better year but 2020 has shaped up to be a good year and you were so faithful throughout it and so we greatly appreciate you i hope that today's service will be a blessing to you we're going to sing praise the lord then i've got a message on luke 1 and then lord's in revival uh, to close out our service uh today god bless you i hope to see you soon if there's any way that we can pray for you it'd be a blessing to you please let us know
lifts up the burdens of those beneath heavy load. The stranger he protects, and the righteous one he trying to make the decision about buying a book, you'd probably start by looking at the cover, the title, maybe the author's name. Maybe you'd look at the back cover and you'd read the blurbs from people telling you why this book was great and you should buy it. Maybe there's even a famous person or a name you've heard of in your field of study. Or maybe you'd look at the front jacket and you'd read about the author and, and who they are and why they'd be a great person to read after. Maybe you'd go on the internet and you'd get reviews about the book and hear from other people about why you should, should consider buying the book. That's how we would buy a book or decide to pick up a book at the library today. In Luke's day, books didn't have a front cover. They didn't have a back jacket where there were blurbs from famous other people. They were scrolls. And the only way to really determine, is this a scroll that I want to buy, or this is a scroll I want to borrow, or this is a scroll I want to pick up and read right now, would be to unroll the first little bit and read a few lines. Now, Luke would have written both of his books, his two books, on a papyrus scroll, a roll of paper. And both of his books, they're very similar in their length. It's like a sequel. He's broken this content matter into two scrolls. Both of them start off with opening lines about why the book was written, what it's about. Luke was writing to us and anyone else who would pick up his book and consider studying it. And he would give us this synopsis of why this book matters. And today, as we begin our study of Luke's two books, in the very beginning, this first Sunday of the year, we're going to be going one chapter at a time, one chapter every Sunday, every week, because there are 52 weeks in the year. And so we're going to be looking at Luke 1, and we're going to start with this synopsis of why should you read the Gospel of Luke? So let's read the opening lines in Luke chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those whom from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. 
We live in an age where so much content is being created that there is no way to possibly take in all of it. Every 24 hours, there are 750,000 hours of video that are uploaded to YouTube. That's more video than the three large main networks, television networks, produced in 30 years of broadcasting. Right now, every day, there are about 5,000 books that are published. This number exploded about 15 years ago when self-publishing and digital publishing became possible, and many people are publishing their own books without having to go through a publisher. The amount of content and information that is out there is staggering to us. Now, in Luke's day, there wasn't a digital format of self-publishing, and there wasn't video content being produced. But Luke did live in a time, like ours is a time of massive communication shift, Luke lived in a time where there was a major shift in communication and content production. For the first time, people were more connected than ever before through the Roman Empire and the Roman road and letter system. People were writing letters, treatises, books, and they were publishing them, sharing them, copying them. It was brand new for it to be produced on such a scale. And so many people, to gain attention for their work, would write in the opening lines, this is why you should read this book. This is why it is so important. Now, in our day and age, because there's so much content out there for people to read our content, to read things that are being produced, people often will, they will fall into, they will do what's called clickbait. It's something that convinces you to pay attention. They make it incredibly uh, scandalous or tantalizing or interesting to get you to pay attention. Now, Luke doesn't scoop to that level of clickbait. But he does make it clear why his writing is worthy of paying attention to. And he does that by differentiating his writing from the many other writings about Jesus. Now, he's not referring to the Gospels that we have in our New Testament, but rather the many books and letters and writings that would have been out there about Jesus' life. Those have been lost to history to us, and only four gospel remains. Four gospels remain. But those, those four that remain, they remain mainly for the same reasons that Luke remains today. There were some things that were true about them, and we believe that they were inspired by the Holy Spirit. But in differentiating his writing from those other writings that would have been present in that day, I think Luke gives us a good picture of why his book is worthy of our time and study this year at Faith Church. First of all, I want you to see that Luke is writing his letter. He differentiates it here in these these lines. He's writing his letter as an insider who has spoken to many eyewitnesses. Luke refers to a, quote, perfect understanding from the very first. And he refers to eyewitnesses and ministers of the word that have delivered the life, the actions, the message, the teachings of Jesus to him. And today there are many books that break through the noise and become bestsellers because they're written by famous people or they're written by people with access to famous people. Luke was someone who had access to the eyewitnesses. Luke doesn't refer to himself in the gospel narrative of Jesus' life, but he does put himself in the narrative of the book of Acts. He most likely wasn't someone who was among Jesus' closest followers, but he was someone who came along and was ministered to, became a convert by those who were Jesus' closest followers. Now, what's important about that is that Luke because of his access to these many eyewitnesses, he was able to write a synthesis bringing all of this material together. Now, if I was going to write your life story, I would only be able to begin where I met you. I wouldn't be able to speak with any detail or authority about the portion of your life that happened before I met you. I would need to speak to people 
who were there. I would need to speak to people who saw you as a child, who saw you growing up. That's exactly what Luke has done. He's spoken to eyewitnesses that were there for Jesus' birth, his childhood, his early ministry. He has spoken to these eyewitnesses and he's passed it down to us. Now there's there's an important application to be made here. What Luke has done is he's done what every solid preacher does. A solid preacher does not give you new material, but rather a solid preacher presents to you ancient material in a way that can be easily understood and applied. And that is Luke's goal. Luke is synthesizing the eyewitness accounts of many people. He's not finding new information, but rather finding truth that has been there and then presenting it in an orderly account so that it can be understood and applied by us. On Sundays or whenever it is that you watch these sermon videos, when I share God's word with you, if I'm preaching new information, I'm not preaching. I'm writing fiction. Preaching is taking the ancient truth of God's word and ordering it in a format, in a presentation that can be understood, appreciated, and applied. It's to take what's already here and make it clear and compelling. My job is like a miner who finds diamonds in the ground and then excavates them and displays them. I am only taking the truth, the ancient truth that is here, and making it clear and compelling to you. That is my calling. And for that reason, Luke is like a preacher, but his writing here is somewhat more like an investigative reporter. What Luke says in verse 3, he he uses two words that do a lot of heavy lifting. He says, having had a perfect understanding. And Luke isn't bragging about how well he comprehends Jesus and his life. Rather, Luke is saying that he has has put a lot of effort into coming to know about Jesus and his life. The word perfect there refers to being circumspect or total or complete. Like a circle would be perfect if it made all the way around it completed the loop. Luke has gone circumspect. He's covered every angle of this. He's looked at it from every eyewitness. He has carefully looked into this. It's for this reason that some translations translate this phrase instead of perfect understanding. They refer to it, they translate it as careful investigation. That's what Luke is saying he has done. He has circumspectly investigated this life and message of Jesus Christ. And the word he uses for understanding is actually the word for following, for following someone. And you can see the connection between following and understanding when I say, hey, are you following me? I'm sharing something with you and I'm asking, are you tracking with me? Are you understanding what I'm saying? Are you following me? And so Luke has had a a, a careful investigation, a careful following of Jesus to come to know Jesus's life and story. Now, this is important because Luke ends up spending 25% of his writings in Luke and in Acts about trials that take place. In his gospel account, it's about the, the trial of Jesus and eventually wrongful execution, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. In the book of Acts, about 25% of his his writing is dedicated to Paul being wrongfully accused, tried. And then his, his book ends before Paul is then later wrongfully executed. And this is important, and it's pertinent to right now for this reason. In both of these cases... There was injustice and there was a conspiracy to kill these men. There was a conspiracy to kill Jesus and there was a conspiracy to kill Paul. If Luke could have desi- if Luke de- desired, he could have he could have written these books about the injustices of the Roman court system. He could have written these books about the conspiracies of powerful people in corporate, political, and spiritual places of authority who brought together a conspiracy to kill these men and cover up their actions. And that would have been incredibly interesting, I think, to a lot of Greek people. 
And also he would have been writing to Theophilus, who refers to as most excellent Theophilus, which is a, a term used to refer to people of noble standing or in places of power. Theophilus may have even been someone who could have had some impact and made a difference in everything that was going on in the Roman court system. Maybe he could have written to someone who could make a difference he could have written things that would have been quite interesting. I don't know about you, but I find true crime podcasts interesting. Perhaps you've gotten wrapped up in a Dateline story about some murder that isn't solved. We can become very interested in the details of these crime stories or these court cases. But while Luke gives us the content of these cases, his focus is not on the interesting details of these crime dramas. His, his emphasis is not on the details of these conspiracies. Rather, his emphasis is upon the meaning of this message and life of Jesus Christ. He is putting together a gospel record that has meaning for us today. Those stories that we get wrapped up in about a true crime that happened years ago and hasn't been solved, most likely it has very little bearing on your life. For me personally, this past year, I became very interested in the Three Gorges Dam in China. The water level at the Three Gorges Dam was incredibly high. It was dangerously high. It looked like it was a very dangerous situation for many people in China. Now, I, I, I don't work on dams. I'm not an engineer. I don't design dams. I don't even have anyone in my life in China. I don't know anyone who lives near the Three Gorges Dam, but I followed that story very closely this past year. And all of us, we can very easily become wrapped up in stories and details, especially when there are, fan, uh, there, there are um, tantalizing details about crime or conspiracy that will sidetrack us. You and I are drowning in a sea of misinformation and non-pertinent information. Luke puts together this narrative not because there are interesting details, but rather he has put together a narrative that has meaning and significance for our lives. Right now, we know more about what is taking place in Washington, D.C. than we know what is happening in our local county and town councils. We're voting for people that we don't even know anything about, but we've seen several of their yard signs. But meanwhile, we know all of the things that are taking place hundreds of miles away. In this massive shift in communication and this deluge of content, you and I are very easily distracted from what does matter by what does not matter. And what Luke has done in his writing of Jesus' life is he is writing about what matters. And Luke's gospel is full of meaning because it focuses on the meaning of Jesus' life. Luke's gospel is full of significance because it focuses on the significance of Jesus' life. And there's a specific way that Luke does this. He does this by writing to a Greek audience. Luke's gospel would be different from many of the other writings about Jesus because of the investigative reporting that would go into it. But it would also differ from many of those writings and the gospels that are in Scripture because Luke was writing to a Greek audience. Matthew wrote to the Jews. Mark wrote an action-packed gospel focused on the actions of Jesus for the Romans, people who were, who were uh, focused on action and building and, and making things happen. John writes his gospel from kind of a 30,000-foot view for all of mankind, all of God's created beings to uh, appreciate. But Luke writes his gospel for the Greeks. He, like, he writes his gospel for Greeks like Theophilus, people who are interested in art and poetry and philosophy. And for that reason, Luke is constantly giving events that took place and then pointing 
beyond the event to the meaning of that event. The Greeks were constantly searching for the meaning of life through philosophy and education and reading and learning. And so Luke is giving them details about Jesus' life and including beautiful moments that the other gospel writers don't include, like songs that were sung by Mary. He's including these beautiful moments to point to the significance and meaning of Jesus' life. See, there are another two words that do a lot of heavy lifting in verse 3. Luke says to put together an orderly account. And Luke is not just referring to a more cohesive narrative by, by means of putting it in the right order. He's giving us an orderly account that points to what really matters. Now, in the King James, the phrase is connected to the following verse, in order that... You, Theophilus, might know the certainty of those things. In the New King James, it is translated as an orderly account. But both translations are getting to the gist of the idea that this account that Luke is putting together is not simply written to put Jesus' life in chronological order. It's going to do that. But it's written rather, most importantly, to put the events of Jesus' life in a persuasive order in an order that shows the significance of Jesus' life. Luke doesn't just go detail by detail. He doesn't give you the story giving you all of the details. Obviously, John would say that if you wrote everything about Jesus that could be written, that the books of the world would not be able to tell it all. So Luke has to focus on the specific things that show us the meaning and significance of Jesus' life. You ever have a friend that tells you a story and they always include details that don't matter to the story? Luke doesn't do that. Luke gives us details that show us the meaning and significance of Jesus' life. Luke will lay out the story of Jesus' life and give us beautiful moment after beautiful moment. He will give us songs and dramatic scenes and they'll come in chronological order. But most importantly, Luke will deliver them in a way that will give us a certainty of faith and what we learn and what's been handed or delivered down to us as Luke referred to it. He's giving us the meaning and the significance. During quarantine, um, the difference between listening to me preach and listening to a world-renowned speaker at a church with the ability to do just world-class broadcasting and production, the difference between listening to me or one of those other guys was just a few clicks. You just made a couple different clicks. You could listen to them speak just as easily as you could listen to me speak. The changes that have taken place have made it obvious that you have plenty of options for preachers to listen to. During our quarantine, our denomination, the National Association of Real Baptists, asked me and other members of the Media Commission, guys who serve uh, to, to put together uh, content from the National Convention each year, they asked us to do a presentation, a Q&A, with uh, pastors, Real Baptist pastors, who were going to be navigating online worship experiences and live streaming for the first time. And what I contributed to that was focus on speaking to your audience. You need to make sure that the technical details are handled. That way people can hear you. This is actually the second time I'm preaching this because the first time I wasn't recording audio. So obviously this wasn't going to be much benefit to you if you couldn't hear what I was saying. But once those details are taken care of, when people can hear what you have to say and there's no distracting elements in the video, focus on speaking directly to your people. I told him, I said, you cannot get caught up in trying to compete with the channels in the mega churches that have the equipment and the directors and the programming people to put together world-class broadcasts. You're not gonna be able to do that. And if that's what your people want, they'll be able to easily find it somewhere else. What you can provide your people in this moment, I said, is you can provide them the message in their context, speaking directly to people that you know exactly what it is that you're going through. 
They know exactly what it is that is taking place in your community. And so speak directly to those people. This year in 2021, you have plenty of options of churches to tune in and watch online. But I have chosen to make our way through the Gospel of Luke this year, and I have chosen that for a specific purpose. I am intentionally building what I hope is a movement of practicing the presence of Jesus. My challenge to us this year is that each week after we have preached on a chapter from Luke's writing, that you will read that chapter in the following weeks. Now, some of you have Bible reading plans, and and that's great. I encourage you to keep doing those things. I'm not asking you to stop that. But read the chapter that we have just gone through the following week. Add that on to your current Bible reading. And some of you aren't reading the Bible at all, and I'd encourage you to read Start here, reading one chapter a week. Some of you want to go further than that. I encourage you to read that one chapter in multiple different translations. On Monday, read it in the King James. On Tuesday, read it in the New King James. On Wednesday, read it in the ESV, and so on and so forth. And go through it and and grab a hold of the nuggets of truth that are here. My prayer is that through the messages on Sunday, where I can't give you all of the information in a chapter, we've just talked about the first four verses of this chapter, hopefully I will whet your appetite for the gold that is in the rest of the chapter. And then the rest of the week, you will read that chapter and you'll be reminded of the truths of the sermon, but also find the powerful truth that lies elsewhere in the chapter that I'm not able to cover each week. Now, Some of you aren't reading anything. You aren't reading your Bible. And in a moment, I'm going to point out a beautiful moment that happens in chapter 1, and hopefully that will encourage you to read your Bible this week. But let me just say this first. As your pastor, I expect you to read your Bible and pray every day. If for some reason you have gotten the impression that that is just something for the Christians who are in the special forces or who are starting players on the varsity Christian squad, know that you should be spending time with Jesus, that that is actually a prerequisite to following Jesus. Joel Green, who wrote one of the best commentaries on the Gospel of Luke, said this in the introduction about the disciples. The disciples found that following Jesus is mostly about being with Jesus. The disciples did not need to merely hear information from Jesus. They needed to learn of Jesus. They needed to be with him and to trust him and watch him. I'm not preaching through Luke to give you information. I am preaching through Luke because I am attempting to, to bring you into the presence of Jesus and encourage you to practice the presence of Jesus. I believe that where we are at as a people in this moment, in time, in place, in this context, connected to this church, in the middle of this pandemic, that the most important thing that you can do, the most important thing that we can do corporately as a church is to practice the presence of Jesus. I believe that right now what we need is to experience what the disciples experienced in those three years of Jesus preparing them for the movement that was to come. And he did that simply by being with them. Now, um, I'm thankful for Zoom and live streaming. I'm thankful that, that all of that is, has been made it possible for us to remain connected even when we aren't able to be present with one another. However, I believe, I'm going to point this out here in just a moment, how powerfully I believe it. I believe that there is something powerful about being present with one another. If the disciples just needed information, God could have zapped it down to them through an angel like he does with angels here in chapter 1 when he sends an angel to speak to John the Baptist's father, Zechariah, and he sends an angel to speak to Jesus' mother, Mary. But Jesus made a point of coming down to be among the people incarnationally, to be among them, to be with them. And I find it striking that Luke, though he wasn't among the followers of Jesus 
when Jesus was there with them, but he was among those who had been with Jesus, that he says, he refers to the all of these things that happened, he refers to it in these verses, he refers to it as the things which have been fulfilled among us. Now, first of all, in that, he's not saying that these are things that simply happen, but rather they have been fulfilled. In other words, he's saying there is a divine intention in all of this. It's not just what has happened, but God had a purpose for it. And it happened among us. I do not believe that I can overemphasize the necessity for us to be people who practice the presence of Jesus. For us to be people who practice the presence of being in the presence of Jesus. In a world where presence has never been more rare, and even before the pandemic, people were rarely truly present with one another. But now in the pandemic, it's even more rare. In a world where presence is truly rare, I think we need to discover afresh and anew what it means to be fully present with God and one another. And I believe that if we spend time with Jesus and practice his presence, that we will become like Jesus. And once we have become like Jesus, then we will be able to do the things that Jesus has called us to do. But we will not get there. If this is just simply something that I talk about on Sundays and you do not practice yourself, you must practice the presence of Jesus yourself. The church is to provide community and it be a place where people come and experience the Spirit. And it's to be like a harbor where people come and in the harbor they're safe and they can find restoration. But there has to be a, a, a reordering in each individual's heart and life. And Dallas Willard pointed out that harbors are great for bringing people, bringing ships in out of the waves and out of the storms of the open seas so that they can be made safe. But he pointed out that if a ship is brought into the harbor and it is made safe in the harbor and it is secured to the dock, but there is never any restoration of that ship's sails or restoration of that ship's engine, it may be safe, but it will not be sound until that is done. And the church can be a place where people are welcomed and, and, and they, they come in and they feel safe. And that is something that our church has been passionate about. But if it's only a place where people come and they tie on to the dock and they feel safe, but they're never made sound, there's never an engine that is rebuilt in them to run under their own steam in their Christian life. There are never the sails of the Spirit attached to their own masts so that they can navigate this life with Jesus, they might be safe, but they are definitely not sound. And I've been doing a lot of walking at the riverfront. Um, doc, my doctor has ordered me to, um, I need to spend time walking, and so I've been trying to walk at the riverfront regularly. And if you're familiar with the Ohio River, here locally, there's a lot of barge traffic, and the barges are pushed by tugboats up and down the Ohio. And those barges are great for floating and carrying a whole lot of stuff. And they can go along with the flow of the river. But if they're going to move with any speed, or if they're going to go against the flow, there has to be a tugboat with a powerful motor pushing them. Now, walking at the river the other day, I realized that there are a whole lot of Christians that are like barges. They can float along. They can go with the flow but they will never be able to move with speed or go against the flow unless there is a powerful tugboat pushing them. And I'm afraid that our churches are full of people who are just barges and they are dependent upon the tugboats of powerful people, powerful preachers pushing them along. Stop being a barge depending upon others to push you along. Take some time in the harbor to be made not only safe but sound, practicing the presence of Jesus, and you will experience the incredible power that comes from the presence of Jesus, and it will do a remarkable thing in your life so that no matter what is happening, if there are storms and, and huge waves and blowing wind out there upon the seas, you are able to move ahead as you are powered by the presence of Jesus to move forward, even against the flow of this culture. Stop being a barge. 
And if me asking you to read your Bible and pray is off-putting or makes you uncomfortable, you should probably go and find a church that doesn't care if you read your Bible. And that's only halfway a joke. And I can definitely recommend you some churches that don't care whether or not you read your Bible. But we are going to be a place that practices the presence of Jesus individually. And this matters. Because what we see later in this passage is that God tells Zechariah and Elizabeth that they're going to have a son, John the Baptist. And then God tells Mary, her cousin, Elizabeth's cousin, that she's going to have a child named Jesus. And so they come together while they're pregnant. And the end of this chapter tells us a story of Mary arriving and Jesus is in her womb. And John the Baptist is there in in Elizabeth's womb. And that John the Baptist leaps for joy in Elizabeth's wombs because because Mary and the presence of Jesus arrived. Now, let me tell you, when, when, when Nicole was carrying our children, it was pretty cool to feel them kick. And, but as cool as that was, it was nothing in comparison to them being out of the womb and holding that child. But here, because of the presence of Jesus here on earth, a child in one womb reacts to the presence of a child in another womb. Jesus' presence was so powerful that it had that kind of impact. Luke begins his first book talking about the arrival of Jesus' presence here on earth. He begins his second book talking about Jesus' ascension and the, and the arrival of the Spirit so that wherever we are as Christians, we have the Spirit with us. Luke's writing is all about the significance of the arrival of God's presence here on the earth and in the hearts and lives of believers. And in studying this this week, it has occurred to me that we are almost like people who have forgotten how to breathe. Because somewhere along the way, Christians became wrapped up in the processes and schedules and events of church, and we have failed to practice the presence of God. But I believe that if we become a people who practice the presence of God, it will be revolutionary and bring about the revival that this world desperately needs. That's what the Gospel of Luke is going to be about the presence of Jesus bringing about transformative, redemptive power and the revival that comes as a result. And that's what we're going to look at in 2021. It's like a river wash over me Immerse me Just see.